Hello, assalamu alaikum and welcome to another program of Health is Wealth. I am your host, Shablam Riaz. Okay, today we have uh, a really, really interesting uh, um, topic that we're going to talk about and it's going to be pediatric surgery. So when you think of pediatric surgery and you know, children and going through uh, you know, procedures like that, you do get a bit emotional. So we have an expert with us today and we're going to talk to Professor Nadeem Akhtar, who's the Chairman and Head Department of Pediatric Surgery at the Children's Hospital PIMS in Islamabad. Thank you very much for joining us once again. Thank you, Shabnam. Thank you for calling it's me. It's a pleasure to have you here. As Same we, here. You know, We had a, a wonderful program yeah. last time as well. So before we get back to our expert, we're going to have a look at this report. Despite efforts to reduce infant mortality rate in the country, Pakistan still ranks among the 10 countries in the world with the highest infant deaths. This continuous and disturbing trend points to the prevalence of pneumonia in the country and lack of protection against it. Pakistan is the seventh country in the world where every year 90,000 children die at the age of five due to pneumonia. Even though a vaccination for pneumonia is available for the children by the state, People are not aware of its importance and access to hospitals is not available for every child. To reduce the infant mortality rate, breastfeeding should be encouraged, along with vaccines for pneumonia, malaria and diarrhea, as well as improving water and sanitation to help with children's survival. Family planning, better nutrition and treatment of childhood illnesses are all important factors contributing to improving conditions. Another very important measure is to ensure that trained and equipped health workers attend every birth and user fee for maternal and newborn health services are removed. Pharmaceutical companies can do more by increasing the availability of products for the poorest new mothers. Government must reaffirm its commitment to saving the lives of young children. Okay, we hope that that has been helpful to you. Um, I would like to ask you, uh, Dr. Nadeem, you know, how many people understand exactly what a pediatric surgeon does? Yeah, uh, pediatric surgery is a well-established uh, field and discipline of surgery. Mm -hmm. It's been in place for more than a, a century, I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, but unfortunately, in underdeveloped countries, uh, its concepts are still not well recognized and understood as mm -hmm. well as in the developed countries. Mm -hmm. So coming back to the situation in our own country, which obviously we are in, more interested, mm -hmm. um, I would say that in urban areas where people have more awareness mm -hmm. and uh, the level of education has gone up over the mm -hmm. period of time, mm -hmm. people now do realize and understand the importance of pediatric surgery. And mm -hmm. the children, if they have any surgical issues, they mm -hmm do want to consult a pediatric surgeon rather than going to surgeons who are not specialists in those particular exactly. areas. Uh, but uh, the, the rural area where obviously most of our masses dwell, so they're, they're the, the, the problem still exists. I mean, mm -hmm. their understanding and the, this is not just their understanding of the masses, but the availability of uh, trained pediatric surgeons are not to that level that mm -hmm. we have in, in the cities. Mm -hmm. So uh, the understanding is developing and I think we are moving towards a time when more and more pediatric surgical centers will be coming up and uh, people now they want uh, specialized care for the children. Right, okay. Now having said that, um, what problems or challenges do you face when you, you know, you're, you're trying to get this message across to parents to understand the difference between a general surgeon and a pediatric surgeon and also, you know, the expertise that you are able to offer for them? Well, we are not in a conflict with, with the general surgeons, let me put it straight. Mm. Uh, we are all healthcare providers at the end of the day. Mm. And pediatric surgery is a super speciality or a subspeciality of a general surgery. Mm. For a, to be a pediatric surgeon, first of all, you have to be a good general surgeon, mm -hmm. and then you become a pediatric surgeon. So we are not at, at a clash with each other. Right. Uh, but the nature of the diseases, the type of diseases, and the mm. way that children are handled, they're totally different from, from adults. Right. So what we say that child is not a small adult, you know, mm. it, it has its own set of requirements, right. it needs its own set of care, its physiology mm -hmm. is different, even mm. the anatomical structures in terms of size. Mm. And um, so the management is altogether different. Yes, it is challenging. It is challenging not only for the public to understand mm. this, but it is also challenging for our colleagues to understand that mm. this is a reality. And uh, mm. uh, with more and more centers and more pediatric surgeons, uh, uh, trained pediatric surgeons being available in most of the, the urban areas in the cities. Mm. So this is time where we should have this referral system in place where children of a certain age, children with certain diseases, they should mm. be referred to, to the trained specialists rather than going into those hands which are not trained in these particular set of uh, patients. Absolutely. Yes. So what ages come into 
Uh, yeah, by definition, domain. pediatric surgery mm. that start from the fetal age, uh -huh. and then following that there is an infancy, and then the mm. childhood, and early adolescent, and even in younger uh, teenage group, it, it goes to as as far as that. Right. So. Um, uh, the definition that we follow, the, the age limits, of course, mm. we follow more the British system, which is a cutoff time is 12 years of age. Uh -huh. But if you follow the American guidelines, it can go up to even 16 years of age. Uh -huh. But this area between 12 and 16 is a transition mm. between a pediatric age and an adult age. Mm. And uh, this is what we call an adolescent age. And mm. that, that also encompasses more of the diseases towards the pediatric population rather than going towards the adults. Mm. So this is the, the, the age group that we generally manage. That you, yeah. that you deal with, okay. Um, because, you know, uh, part of this program is to sort of, you know, give information to our viewers. And many, many things are cleared up, many myths and uh, sort of many areas of confusion. So, you know, as I was thinking, a parent has a child with let's say, a heart problem, they would be rather, you know, they would be thinking along the lines of taking them to see a cardiologist. But actually, they need to see a pediatric surgeon. That, that's what they should be doing. Well, uh, I would say that the first line of treatment, of course, is a pediatrician. Mm. It is always, if a parents have any problems, they must go to the family physicians, to the pediatricians who should look at the child, even mm -hmm. if he has got a severe Mm. problem. I'm talking about those problems which are hidden. Mm. Um, there, there, there are two set of problems. Of course, there, there, there are diseases which are which are overt and the parents know it immediately, so they mm. would know where to go. But those diseases which are hidden, like you have mentioned about a congenital cardiac problem. Mm. So the, the, it is a pediatrician who would pick it decide. up and then he would decide Way whether yeah, whether, okay. whether that particular child needs a mm. medical care or did need some surgical intervention. Right. And then he would also decide the timing, like when does mm. he form, when, it, when, when does he actually need an mm. opinion of a cardiac, pediatric cardiac surgeon. Mm. So uh, the first line of management, the first line of treatment still remains the, the physicians and the pediatricians. Right, okay. You spoke about also, you know, when we were talking about the age, uh, the age group, you were talking about the fetal uh, part of the development of the baby. So surgery at that time, tell us about that. Yeah, it is still in the in the embryonic stage, I would say, as mm. as, as it goes. But uh, be mindful of the fact that all the children who are born with congenital abnormalities, the problem starts antenatally in the fetal life, mm. and that is what they are born with. Mm. So there are many diseases that can be picked up antenatally in okay. our country, although mm. fetal surgery is not being offered as as a surgery per se in our country. But right. we can at least pick them up with a screening antenatally, mm. a good mm. antenatal ultrasounds, for instance, mm. can pick up many conditions. Mm. And instead of a rude shock coming to the parents that exactly. the child once born has mm. a very severe congenital cardiac mm. or any other general abnormality. Oh, yes. So they, they, they can be aware of these problems well mm. before time. Mm. And so that, number one, they can plan where the child has to be delivered. Right. So that after the delivery, they don't have to rush or run to a tertiary care center looking for a pediatric surgeon. Okay. Secondly, the timing of surgery can be decided mm. so that uh, if an elective cesarean section is being done, so mm. it should not be a weekend where the surgeon should, is not available or it is not done in a place where mm. the surgical facilities are not available at hand. So I think antenatal screening of the fetuses is, is something that is now in place mm. and the anomaly scans and the other scans the which anomaly are done. scans yeah right. so they pick up those problems quite early okay. and uh, so as far as the fetal surgery is concerned as you asked mm. this is still uh, a luxury here because we don't have the trained uh, personnel to do that and then it's a very very expensive and still in its developmental stage i would say mm. so in developed countries there are only few selected centers where it offers a limited form of surgery but obviously in, in future mm. this is something futuristic it's, which we'll, we will see a lot of surgery being done uh, in, the, in the fetal life. Yes. Right it's something that still that is being developed okay as you you know told us about the anomaly scans and finding out if a couple is is going to have a baby which has uh, congenital issues what then is the next step when the baby is delivered then the, they would go to an ECU? Is that what would happen? Well, this all depends upon the, the kind of abnormality. Okay. All the babies need not go to the intensive care units. Okay. Uh, the ones who carry severe congenital malformations, like where the surgery is going to be done immediately or need surgery in a day or two and they need optimization. Mm. For instance, I'll give you an example. A child mm. is born uh, with a common problem that we call it intestinal atresia. It means that there is a discontinuity in the uh, continuity of the intestine at some point. Mm -hmm. So uh, we know immediately after birth or beforehand mm. that this child is going to need surgery. Mm. 
Okay. So these are the kind of patients who they need intensive care unit, not okay. immediately, maybe in a day or two once they're being operated after being optimized. Right. Then there are a set of patients who are delivered and they, they are very, very sick immediately. For instance, if a child has a hole in the diaphragm, he cannot breathe, hmm. his circulation is not, not well. So these are the patients who need intensive care unit. Hmm. Uh, unfortunately, the, the NICU, as you have said, this becomes a limiting factor. It's a bottleneck. Hmm. We have very few neonatal intensive care units right. and this limits our surgical abilities mm. to that level that mm. we don't have the post-operative care, the areas where these children can be safely managed and handled. Right. So um, uh, only very few centers in urban areas in the, in the public setups, they offer intensive care unit. And in the private setups where the intensive care units are available, they are very, very expensive. Mm, uh, okay. It's a very staggering cost, which, which is then mm. inflicted on the family and uh, everyone cannot afford those uh, intensive care units. Mm, that's, that's absolutely true. And, um, you know, when, when you, we were talking about these congenital issues, what are s some of the common ones uh, in our, I mean, is this something specific to parts of the globe or? A worldwide I think uh, it's, it's a worldwide phenomena okay. and uh, the bulk of that is where pediatric surgery came into existence there were a group of people they were asked to manage patients with congenital abnormalities and that is where they okay. thought that they would probably do better as a specialty right. so a large chunk of our specialty of our time of our care is taken by uh, the problems where children are born with those problems mm. as you asked the I can name uh, many of them like a club foot for mm. instance uh -huh. a cleft lip or a hair lip what we call a it a cleft lip is very common uh, very common a cleft yeah. palate mm. there's a hole in the the, the palate child cannot mm. swallow by mm. easily then there are many problems which which are not visible you know which mm. for instance there is a there's a condition called tracheoesophageal fistula where the trachea and the esophagus I won't even are, try saying they, that they, they, they are, <laughs> I'll just uh, simplify it for you where the tra trachea and the esophagus they're, they're united with each other okay. the child would cannot swallow anything there's no esophagus and whatever he's breathing is going into his intestine. Mm. Then there are atresias, like the intestine is not continuous, there is a discontinuity at some point, mm. there are urological problems, mm. uh, hydrocephalus, like the size of the head is very, very big, there's a lot of water in the head, uh -huh. there can be a lump at the back. So mm -hmm. there is a huge list which goes on and on, right? Same Starting from every organ to, to the systems, right. so the child can have any kind of a congenital abnormalities. Okay, so, um, you know, we're talking about picking up uh, these um, issues before the baby is born. What about when you know these things haven't been picked up? We're talking about rural areas where maybe there weren't facilities for uh, extensive ultrasound or, or care during the pregnancy. What then? I think this is a, a big dilemma. This is a very big issue for, for the families mm. where they have to pick up what is going wrong with the child. Mm. As I, the, some of the diseases that I've mentioned, which are mm. very much obvious, the parents would know it immediately mm. and they run to the hospitals for, for care. Mm. But there are many uh, diseases which are not picked up mm. and uh, where the parents would only come to know when the child is not feeding well, mm. the child is continuously vomiting for, the, mm. for several days after birth, mm. he's not picking up weight, right. he's not breathing properly, and that is the time mm. when they would go to, to the nearest uh, medical facility which mm. is available and then we don't have trained personnel to pick them up even there and then they will go to, to the basic health units. And, and to, then they're to, running around in circles. They're running around right? unless they find an appropriate person who would know and diagnose what those conditions are and uh, not only that there have been instances where uh, these um, uh, babies have been admitted even in teaching hospitals where some of the congenital abnormalities could not be picked up because mm -hmm. of the lack of awareness or not mm. being seen by the specialists. Mm. So yes, this, this continues to be uh, mm. a problem which will be faced uh, for, for, for many years So what years can we come. do, what can be done to, I mean, of course, I mean, the obvious thing is that pediatric surgeons, we need to reduce that deficit. I think we need to impart more training to, to at an education, uh, especially to at an undergraduate level to our medical students. Okay. So that they are aware of these congenital abnormalities, number mm. one. Secondly, through media like programs like you are running which, which I, we appreciate and also through public awareness mm. that look a child can be have many serious underlying problems mm. and uh, a baby should be examined from head to toe after birth so mm. if we include this as a part of examination of every child who's born mm. so i think many of these diseases can be picked up mm. okay right uh, let's talk about uh, children with um, oncological issues how many do you see, is this something on the rise, is it? Yes, uh, uh, tumors or cancers or the oncological problems do exist in children and mm. that would sometimes very early part of the life and mm. we have 
uh, tumors like Wilms tumor, which is a tumor of the kidney, mm -hmm. neuroblastoma, which is mm -hmm. a common tumor of the, the early childhood. Okay. Um, rhabdomyosarcoma, which arises from the muscles, it can arise from anywhere. Mm. So these are some of the, the malignancies, and, and even we see lymphoma, even we see blood cancers in children. Mm. So any tumors which occur in adults, can, there are many which, which present very early in childhood. Mm. Mm. Uh, unfortunately, uh, these tumors are also picked up very late. Mm. Because, you know, the, the cure of these tumors, that all depends at what age the child is picked up, okay. how he's well Is it because treated. the symptoms are silent or is it because that maybe people weren't paying attention? I think there are they're, they're, they're two factors. One is mm. that the parents are not aware that what is going on. Okay. And secondly, if at all, they, they come to know that there's some problem mm. and they do go to, to people, they, are not, they don't understand what, mm. what actually is going on with the child. For mm. instance, this Wilms tumor, as I said, this is yes. a tumor of the kidney. We see it very, very often. Uh -huh. uh, in West, it's, it's a cure. They, mm -hmm. they usually present in stage one, mm. where we remove the kidney, and that's a cure. Mm. But most of the tumors of these patients that come to me in, in our hospital, at the Children's Hospital at PIMS, mm. they are, uh, are always, most of them are late referrals. Right. And by that time, the tumor has already spread to different cavities, to mm. different areas of the mm. body. Mm. And uh, alone surgery is not enough. Then they need chemotherapy, okay. they need radiotherapy, then the chances of recurrence and all that mm. is very, very high. What round ages are we talking about here? We are talking here of age like two years to five years or seven years of age. Mm. But then there are children who are born with diseases, mm. with, with tumors. Okay. So those are, just, are, are rare. Mm. But uh, in, in these children, even the ones which are picked up, they, they're picked up very late. Mm. And by the time they come to us, uh, I think they, they have missed the train and, and uh, the pain and the suffering and the misery mm. is compounded by several folds. It must be an awful thing to go through, yes, both absolutely. at the parents' uh, level, the child's level and your level as well, yeah. to you know, think that you know, this is something that yeah. could have been picked up earlier. So what are the symptoms? Are there any symptoms that yes, people Yes, it depends upon which tumor we are talking about. Okay. But since most of them are the abdominal tumors, so mm. the first is that there's a, there's a mass. So the mother, while bathing a child, mm. would feel that there's a lump or there's some uh, uh, protrusion of the abdomen. That is okay. the first symptom. Then they can have some blood coming in the urine, mm. loss of weight, loss mm. of appetite, child mm -hmm. is not well, there may mm. be fever which may be running for a very long time. Mm. So with these symptoms and signs, the parents should uh, come to the specialist and, and look. But coming to your point that, yes, the breaking the news to the parents is really one of the most... Uh, yeah, we, we need a big heart to break the news that the child exactly. is having a cancer. Mm. So we have to take those angles into consideration mm. before we really treat them. It's not mm. just a, the medical management needs a lot of psychological therapy and a lot of sitting with them and counseling them what the child is going through and what mm. is coming their mm. way in, 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 in terrible, the coming time. Yes. So what made you want to become a pediatric surgeon? <laughs> uh, because it's not, an, it, yeah. I, I, you know, it's, you have to separate your emotions yes. from, the, how do you do that on a daily well, basis? Well, uh, to, to be very frank and honest, I wanted to become a pediatrician and I, I, my first job was in pediatrics. Okay. So when I joined there, I, I realized that there are many patients who come with surgical problems and issues mm. and there are not very many pediatric surgeons in our country. Mm. And I just happened that we had a pediatric surgical department where I was being trained mm. and uh, I opted it as a speciality and uh, developed a passion for it which is now in the 32nd year of my life which I'm continuing and uh, you know there's not been a, a single day I've been away from from my patients and from this uh, field fantastic. so um, it is a wonderful speciality mm. the, but as I say that this this is one speciality which needs a lot of input of time mm. in terms of your training. Mm. So it is not, uh, uh, it's difficult mm. in terms of you have to give a lot of time and a lot of training, a lot of uh, understanding before mm. you actually become a pediatric surgeon. Yes. Absolutely, that's true. You know, um, very demanding on many levels. Okay, so what services are available at, at your hospital? Well, at our hospital, we have uh, general pediatric surgical uh, uh, doctors, which are trained surgeons available with us. We deal with the age range from birth till 12 years of age. Mm -hmm. So we have a neonatal intensive care unit, mm. which offers uh, a very comprehensive neonatal intensive care facilities, mm. both preoperatively as well as postoperatively. Mm. Uh, space is always a constraint because the number of patients which come to us, mm. we are overwhelmed at times. Of course. Uh, then we have a high dependency areas for new nates, mm. where it's a specialized dedicated area which mm. has been made with the help of uh, some of the donors and also by the government, mm. where we offer a, a midway treatment between an intensive care and the general ward. Mm -hmm. Then we have uh, general pediatric wards where we deal with all kind of 
pediatric surgical problems, mm. both congenital, acquired, trauma, mm. and common pediatric surgical issues which are related to children like hernias, mm. uh, appendices, and mm. uh, neurosurgery, and orthopedic surgery, mm. and trauma and head injuries. Obviously, they, they, they um, at times our patients are more than the other other patients mm. that we have. So, it, under one roof, we are offering a very comprehensive pediatric surgical care. And then we are supported by a very strong pediatric department. Okay. We have an oncology department with mm -hmm. us. We have the neurosurgical facilities, the IE, ENT. Right. And we are doing all full range of endoscopic surgeries, starting from the upper GI endoscopy to the lower GI endoscopy. Mm -hmm. Foreign bodies are very important components of, of, of patients who inhale or ingest foreign bodies. So mm -hmm. we, we have all facilities to handle those. Mm -hmm. Uh, minimal invasive surgery is another area that, uh, or a keyhole surgery as you call it. Mm -hmm. uh, we still are not to that level as international levels because of uh, the pub being a public hospital, mm. the number of patients resources. are so many mm. and the resources are limited. And so overwhelmed. The, overwhelmed, yeah. So yeah. that is something that we, we need to look what at. What exactly is keyhole surgery? Keyhole surgery is where the surgeon does not really open the, the field of his, his surgery to, 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 is to the level. Is it the level. laparoscope sort of? Yeah, it's a laparoscope where we mm -hmm. make small holes okay. with the key and keyhole size and we go in with small instruments, just okay. like playing the video games. You know, you're, you're mm -hmm. just looking mm -hmm. at the monitor and mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're operating. This is where the world is heading mm -hmm. to. It's an established way of uh, operating on children. But uh, lack of time and uh, lack of resources, that limits us to, to, right. to extend to these, yes. Okay. Um, tell us about, you, know, you mentioned hernias. Tell us about uh, what they exactly are and how a parent can spot. Hernia is a lump or a swelling which is visible at a particular site. And the commonest hernias that we talk about in children are the inguinal hernias. Mm -hmm. uh, umbilical hernia is another form of hernia which does not need surgical intervention because it tends to cure itself by the child time the child is school going of age. Mm -hmm. But inguinal hernias can be uh, a very daunting task for the parents and for, 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 for the surgeons because uh, there is no cure for, for a hernia. There is no self-cure. Because mm. parents think that the child is, is still a child and as the age would go on, mm. maybe it mm. gets cured. Mm. So there is, there is no history, uh, there is no case in, in medical history where mm. there is a self-cure for an hernia. They have to be operated. And the recommendation is as early as, as uh, the earlier the better because mm. then the complications are very many. The intestines can get obstructed. Right. So basically hernia is that the, the, uh, some viscous like an intestine that protrudes through a, through a defect or an opening mm. and comes more towards the surface where it appears in the form of a lump. Mm. which the mother notices mm. and uh, at times it disappears when the child is sleeping or relaxed mm. and when the baby is training it, it pops out. Mm. So um, uh, it should be uh, uh, surgical attention should be sought at the earliest and uh, the, the operation should be done at the earliest mm. because there is no other alternative option uh, mm. except surgery. Right, okay. Um, so you know you, you're telling us uh, about uh, um, the urban areas where we have these facilities and then we have the rural areas where unfortunately you know pediatric surgeons are not e easily found so what needs to be done uh, in terms of future planning to be able to make sure that the maximum number of people can benefit from this you see we have a very high birth rate here and uh, uh, which will continue to go high mm. you know in south asia we stand at one of the highest birth rates here so obviously we have more uh, children who have problems, surgical issues, mm. trauma, as I said, that the accidents are so rife, mm. the, the loads of patients mm. who need surgical problems. I think, number one, we need to introduce pediatric surgery as a subject right. and at the undergraduate level, mm. where a proper training should be imparted to exactly. these. And then we need to increase the number of centers. Mm. We cannot have pediatric surgical centers everywhere. Nowhere mm. in the world they are available in the rural areas. Mm. We need to strengthen our referral system. Mm. We need to uh, strengthen the basic health units, the, mm. the, the primary health care system to mm. the level, mm. the Tehsil, uh, you know, health mm. system and uh, to the level where these babies can be picked up mm. and referred to those surgical centers mm. which are offering Nearest. those services, mm. yes. So um, at nowhere in the world we have uh, pediatric surgery being carried in the rural area. It's not possible. You mm. need the anesthetist, you need intensive care, you need special beds. Yes. It is a, uh, a difficult thing. 
The other thing is that now the, the concept is the, that of children's hospital. You know. mm. It is not special just the children's ward or the mm. pediatric surgical it's ward. It's a whole The whole hospital. And this is entity. not a new concept. It's, it's in course. place for, for almost uh, 50 years now mm. in the world. Mm. And we are heading towards that. We have a children's mm. hospital here in Lahore. We have a children's hospital in, in all the major big cities. Mm where under one roof you offer all kind of pediatric services to the, to the children, whether it be the surgical or the mm. medical. Mm. So I think that is the, the area where we should be heading for, have more children hospitals in, mm. in at least major areas and a proper referral system. Right. Okay. Um, let's talk about SIDS or cot death. That's something that is very common in the West, I think. How common is that in Pakistan, or, or is it just that we don't know about it? What? Well, I think uh, sudden infant death syndrome, as it is mm. called, uh, which where the child dies for without any reason, and mm. I think it is one of the most dreadful deaths in a way that the parents just put a child to sleep who's healthy otherwise and mm. find him dead in the morning. You exactly. See. Um, we don't have any data or any any, any uh, you know uh, figures where we can okay. really say that we have less or the West has more. Mm. Um, Probably the family system is such in our country, you know, mm. that uh, the children are not left alone. There are many members mm. of the family in, 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 the, in the house to mm. look after the children, even once they're asleep. True. And uh, whereas in the West, it is uh, the short, smaller family system, you know, mm. so they probably have more. And usually issues. the baby will go into a nursery that is exactly. um, prepared before the birth of the exactly. child. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, but these are preventable. Mm. Number one is the, the positioning of the child. That is okay. what is uh, one of the contributing factors to mm. SIDS. Um, after feeding a proper burping techniques mm. should be used so that basically the child vomits and aspirates and chokes mm. and uh, the, the leads to, 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 to the death. So if the pro properly positioned child in a, in a, in a What cart, is the proper you know, position? Well, it, it, it should be the lateral position is the best position. The child should be put on side, on either the, side. the right side or the left side. Okay. In a way the child can't should not become roll moved, over yeah. or move. So probably that is the best position. And but before feeding, the child should be properly burped, and you should have sufficient time before you put him to sleep without having any attendance okay. over there. So th these are all preventable deaths, mm. which which can be prevented. And uh, mm. as I said, uh, that uh, in West probably the data is available. We can talk about that. So we don't have the data here, mm. but uh, I'm sure children, a lot of children die because of this. Okay, right. What advice do you give uh, you sort of new mothers who come to see you and they're a bit sort of distraught and are completely overwhelmed with, you know, a new baby in the house? And uh, maybe not all of them can have the privilege of having, you know, parents living nearby or, or somebody else who's, who's an experienced person to help them. So how do you, what's your advice to them? Well, for a, especially a, a child born to, to, to the, the first born in the family mm. and the parents not aware like how to handle a baby. Exactly. Uh, it's always very challenging for them. Mm. And um, uh, the best way to go about is, of course, educate them in terms of handling babies mm. because at times they overdo things, yeah, which can be like we see babies who are wrapped, who yes. are wrapped in many layers mm. and the temperature can go up. Mm. and the, the proper feeding techniques are not properly used mm. and they can vomit, they can aspirate and they can choke. Mm. The temperature of the room is kept very high. Mm. Many children are not given a bath, for instance, by the parents with their fear that the child may develop Catch cold, cold yeah. or may, may become sick. Mm. So I think these are the things which are now available on the net. There, mm. there, are, there are awareness programs which are available and the parents, they have uh, enough time to educate themselves before mm. the newborn is, is coming to, to know how to handle. Mm. But as health providers, we always counsel them mm. uh, that uh, how to, to manage. And we have specialized clinics as well, mm. well baby clinics, mm. where these babies or uh, the parents are referred, where they can be given uh, education of managing their firstborns. Right, okay. So you spoke about post-operative care as well. You Generally, I mean, of course, depending on the operation and surgery that a child has had, what how long does it take them to recover? This all depends on the type of surgery. Like mm -hmm. uh, common operations, as we, as we said, like hernias and hydroseals and mm -hmm. uh, hyperspadias, these are done as daycare surgery. Uh -huh. Luckily, I would say the nature is very kind. Children have very good healing powers. Mm, because they're very it's, resilient. They're very resilient mm. to, to infections, good healing powers. Mm. They tolerate pain very, very well. Mm. So. Uh, very large number of surgeries can be done as a daycare. Mm. So that also decreased the, the amount to the national exchequer as well because the parents come in, they get operated and mm. they, they would go home on the same day or the same afternoon. So, uh, so the daycare centers are, are a separate uh, entity within the hospital itself where mm. the post-operative okay. care is given 
to for a few hours only. Mm. But then the children who undergo major surgical operations, mm. they have to be given care in ICUs or the intensive care units. If they are new nurse, then they go into the NICUs and mm. adults or little older children, they go to the other uh, mm. pediatric ICUs. Um, the, the length of stay or the duration is very variable. That depends upon the type of surgeries that we, we do and what kind of whether if, when they, if suppose for instance if the intestine is open mm. for any reason they mm. have to stay for five to six days at times with us. Okay. And if the chest is open for instance for any major surgical intervention mm. they may require even longer stay. So this all depends on what intervention is done. Mm. So when we're talking about diagnosing a disease as well, do, does that have a t completely different sort of a, a strategy to that as well? Your, your yes, it is, absolutely. For instance, if you order an ultrasound or a CT scan, you need a child who is sedated. Mm. A moving child cannot have an MRI. They need to be put into, into anesthesia before, before it is done. Mm. So uh, the, even the interventional modalities preoperatively and mm. the diagnostic modalities, they're altogether different. The probes, for instance, for ultrasound, they're very, very small in size. Mm. So everything is different. It's, it's, mm. it's a different uh, set a of individuals. It's a different yes. world. In fact. That's why I said that it is the concept is that of children's hospitals. You know, where exactly. under one roof you have all the uh, facilities to investigate, mm. to manage, diagnose, and treat, and then uh, follow up. Right. Let's talk about uh, self-medication and uh, the problems mm -hmm. that we bring upon ourselves. I mean, okay, when you're a, when you're an adult and you're able to, you know. Uh, deal with the fallout of self-medication as well, which is not something that we should be doing anyway. But then we're talking about children, and many times you can hear people saying, you know, somebody's got a cold or whatever, and you're with friends or family, and they say, you know, just give him or her this, and they'll be okay because it worked for my child. Tell us about the dangers of self-medication. I self think self-medication is very deeply and rooted in our culture and society, mm. and it is going on for decades and generations yeah. have gone. And I, I would say that this is all preventable if off-the-shelf medication is stopped, you know, mm. if we have legislation and mm. enforcement, of course, mm. where medicines are not sold without prescription. Right. So, um, for instance, uh, a child would have a common flu, mm. uh, just running nose, and the mm. parents would start antibiotics on yeah. their own. Yeah. And they would complicate the whole thing to a level where the child may end up with serious complications. Imagine. And this also happens in surgical problems. For instance, the child has a small abscess, a little uh, wound. Mm. They would start treating without knowing what actually what actual medicines are going to work and mm. how to manage it. Mm. The child may need some surgical intervention and they may continue giving antibiotics for a very long time and develop complications. Serious complications can, can, can develop. Mm. So I think that is something which the, the community and the, and the health care providers here mm. and the legislators should come up where the self-medication should, mm. should be, uh, the, at least the medicines should not mm. be, um, the, the vendors should stop providing these medicines, yes. Yeah, as you mentioned antibiotics, it seems that we have this dependency on them and that, uh, you know, many people have the idea that unless you take an antibiotic, you're not going to get better. How do we change this mindset? Well, I think this can be, again, public awareness. We keep coming back to the same mm. point. But let me tell you one thing, Shablam, that in future there are no antibiotics, no new antibiotics are coming. Mm. Uh, the, the pharmaceutical industry has stopped investing money in, in getting new antibiotics. Mm. So there's nothing more in the pipeline. Mm. So whatever antibiotics we have, mm. these are the ones, and if we have uh, antimicrobial resistance to these antibiotics, mm. so we will be heading for a very big disaster, which is looming very, very in real time, you know. Mm. And um, there are reports that scores and even thousands and millions of people can die from mm. from from uh, uh, resistance strains of bacteria, mm. and we see that in tuberculosis, for instance. Right. Now, most of the drugs, the, the first line drugs, they're not working against patients who have tuberculosis because of because of, because of the mutations, the bacteria. They tend to change mm. the dimensions, mm. and same is true for for many other mm. uh, bacteria which which are there. So, mm. if we use it judiciously mm. without any reasons, mm. the way we are using, mm. so we are probably heading towards that direction where our children would be very, very vulnerable to, to mm. these. So this is something, a message which, which should be sent across. Mm. So that's very important, what um, uh, Professor Nadeem is saying, that you know the use of antibiotics, not just for yourself, but for your family members as well, and the people that you know around you. You know, self-medication does have its own uh, implications and its own, you can uh, take, as uh, Professor Nadeem said, you can take a very simple situation and make it so many times worse by yourself. Okay, so um, we'll be coming back to our expert. Right now we're taking a break. Don't change the channel.
Okay, welcome back to the program. Um, let's talk about now, you know, we're approaching the end of the program. We've been able to talk about so many things that are so informative. And let's talk about trauma as well, mm, head injuries, accidents. I think uh, it's very unfortunate that uh, children have to bear the brunt of head injuries and road traffic accidents, mm. even more than adults. Mm. Uh, and many of these injuries are preventable. Hmm. And they have, it can have consequences which can be lifelong. Of course. Disabilities which can lead to total devastation for the entire family. Hmm. They can lose uh, a lot of their, their money in trying to get hmm. children treated for those disabilities that hmm. they develop hmm. in, in connection with the trauma. Hmm. For instance, we get a lot of these patients who fall from the roof. Yeah. So the question arises, why are the children sent to the rooftop which do not have the protection? Exactly. So this is something which is entirely preventable. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we are happy now that we don't have festivals like Basant anymore, mm. where a lot of these children were coming we're with coming major with surgical problems and trauma. But trauma terrible. still remains a very mm. important mm. Uh, uh, part. It must make up a, a bulk of, of, of the burden of. Absolutely. Uh, our wards at times are filled mm. with patients. We have more patients of trauma at times as compared to the surgical problems. Mm, who mm, are. Mm. So head injuries are number one, which are preventable. The mm. rooftop injuries, children falling or slipping mm. off the roof, number one. Secondly, uh, children are like the, the, the um, uh, vehicle in injuries. There are no laws like where to how to place a child within, within a moving uh, vehicle. Mm. So they, they don't have these seats, special seats mm. for the Car children. Seats for the baby. And they, uh, most of the time they're sitting in the lap of a mother, a small baby. In the front and seat. And once uh, the, you know the brake is applied, and the child would fly off to the windscreen and would hit and shatter the face, and, and, and uh, sustain uh, fractures of the mm. skull. And then uh, children cross the road, which at, at points where there are no zebra crossings, which mm. are not attended by by mm. adults. Mm. They are just playing on the roadside, mm. and they get uh, hit by moving vehicles. In fact, you know if you drive around you can see sometimes that there are Absolutely. very young children exactly. standing yeah. in front of their houses yeah. unattended yeah. and unguarded exactly uh, and suddenly they would start running on the road course. and they would hit a, a so these are all preventable mm. injuries i would say and uh, if if something is done and at least the parents know uh, everything cannot be done by the state of what course, do you say to the parents who come in and you know they've they've been careless because at that time, of course, it is the responsibility of the parent. When you've brought a child into the world, no excuse is enough to say, well, you see, I was busy or yeah, whatever. Yeah. What, what do you say to them? Well, for the head injury patients, I always tell them that if the child fell and had these injuries and he's very lucky to have survived, mm. it can happen again. Right. So once you go back to your home, mm. kindly make all the necessary precautions and arrangements mm. for the child mm. uh, should not be unattended at the rooftop mm. and should have those fences placed in, in well placed so that they, they don't tip over. Mm. So uh, that is a message we, we always give to these mm. to these parents. Yes. Mm. And what about electric shocks, things like yeah, that? Yeah, electric shocks, the, I think. The power, uh, the power yeah. sockets who are available for yeah, a child. Yes, the power to. sockets should not be uh, within the reach of a child, mm. uh, especially the toddlers who's just mm. learning to see new things. And He's, they want to check out everything. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they want to touch everything. Exactly. So invariably they're going to turn it the switch on and uh, they, ah. they can get uh, electric shock which can be life threatening. Mm. How many of those do you, do you see? We, we see more of electric burns, electric especially burns. in winters, you know, once uh -huh. uh, we, they are not from electricity these days, more from, from the gas, you know. Uh -huh. The gas heaters are placed and children are unattended, they would go, their clothes can catch fire. Oh. And then scald, scalding injuries from, from hot waters which are kept uh, within uh, the reach of a child. Mm. So these uh, number of cases they pick up in, mm. in during the, the winter months. Right, okay. So, um, again, m many of these things are just common sense, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, many of these things are just being a bit more attentive yeah, yeah. Uh, to, to your child. Yeah. And, uh, in fact, so many things that we talk about regularly on this show, not just this episode, is prevention. Yeah. And, and to bring in a mindset. Now, as you mentioned, you've mentioned quite a few times, that it's all about, you know, getting that message across. Mm -hmm. It's all about promoting mm -hmm. an idea and changing a mindset. So, you know, how can, we, we can also do that within families as well. We don't, we don't have to rely on the media. This is something that we can do as an individual 
uh, sort of an effort as well within the families yes, and then the, get the, that thing yes, across. The adults within the family, they, they, they must know. These are the common sense things. Like, I would add one more thing here, which, which are the toys, you know, with, with the children playing. Oh, that's really, and really And really they good. have those batteries which are made up of uh, small batteries which, mm. which they, they are powered with. Mm. And the children, child is very inquisitive, you know, he has a very inquisitive course, mind. Yeah. He wants they, to open up. They to put everything into the mouth. Exactly. So they would swallow these batteries and they mm. can explode. And recently we had a patient who, whose aorta was ruptured, his esophagus was ruptured that little small mm. innocent looking piece of metal he swallowed and it, it exploded oh, inside. So these are all preventable injuries. Of course the law should be there, children mm. should not have access to them, mm. but then the parents, parents also need, need to, to play their role. Very yes. careful. Professor Nadeem Akhtar, thank you very much for being with us here today on the show. We've, uh, it's been a pleasure speaking to you and I'm sure so many things have been so valuable for the people watching. Thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to, to come to your program and talk to you again. Thank Likewise. you. Likewise. The pleasure is all ours. Okay, so you know, again, 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 we go, and go on like a broken record. Prevention, 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 better than cure. Why not, you know, look after uh, your loved ones, your children, I mean, your children are just those treasured gems that you want to look after forever. So, you know, be attentive and be careful, and especially as Dr. Nadeem said, you know, look out for those hazards that are there lurking in your home. Okay, until we see you again next week, stay happy, stay healthy. Bye-bye.